All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Tuesday morning Bible class here at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Germantown in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. We thank you for taking some time out of your week, uh, our day, to join us for our Bible study as we continue looking at the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis. And we're going to be beginning a new lesson today. Um, it's marked uh, Lesson 7. Uh, it's in the Facebook feed just below this video, it should be just below this video. Um, you should should see a link to um, this lesson. It's called Lesson 7, The God of Faithful Love and Justice. And it covers Genesis chapters 18 and 19. So if you like to follow along in your Bibles, we're going to be in Gen start in Genesis 18. If you like to follow along with the study guide, that should be in the Facebook feed right below this video and covers, um, it's called Lesson 7, it covers verses, uh, chapters 18 and 19. This is a very famous part of the book of Genesis and the story of Abraham, um, the story of, um, of Abraham's life, uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, um, so just have a couple of, of introductory comments before we jump into the text, and then, uh, and then, uh, sorry, a couple of introductory comments and, and prayer, and then we'll jump right into the text because uh, this is a little longer section that we to cover two chapters in one lesson. Usually we just do one at a time. But the story really um, bridges over to two different chapters. So let's uh, begin our study with prayers. We pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Lord of all things. All things have been placed under your feet, and you rule over all things for the good of your church. It is with this confidence that we come before you today asking for your blessing on our study of your word. We ask that you would help us to see your faithful love shown to your people, the, the grace and mercy and forgiveness uh, that we do not deserve and have not earned. And yet also that you would show us your perfect justice, uh, that, that you will not be mocked, that you will uh, unleash your wrath and your anger and your punishment against those who oppose you, those who live lives that are in opposition to you and to your word. Help us to see you in your entirety, that we might always worship you as the one true God. We ask this in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, just a couple of, of very brief comments before we jump into uh, the text. The, the first comment I want to make is just a reminder of where we're at in the in the story of Abram, or Abraham now. Um, you've got chapter 12, the call of Abraham. Chapter 13 is the not-so-good story of Abraham going down to Egypt. Um so I'll make sure that I have that right. Uh, yeah, chapter 13 is him going down to Egypt. Or, sorry, it's chapter 12 still. Chapter 13 is where Lot and uh, Abraham separate. Chapter 14 is where Abraham rescues Lot from the coalition of the kings. Chapter 15 is the one-sided covenant that God makes with Abraham um, through the, the Babylonian blood covenant where the smoking fire pot and the blazing torch pass through the pieces of the cut up animals and he makes the promise that um, his descendants will possess the land chapter 16 is this um, another embarrassing moment in abraham's life with the whole sarah and hagar um, and the birth of ishmael and then chapter 17 which we looked at last week is the covenant of circumcision or the covenant sign of circumcision that god gives to abram uh, Abraham to uh, to seal the one-sided promise that he had made to him that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. And now um, we're going to get to kind of another high in the life of Abraham, the faith life of Abraham, which is his pleading on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, his intercession on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. The other thing that I just want to remind remind ourselves of before we look at the text, because what we're gonna when we get uh, into chapter nineteen, we're gonna get to Lot again, and just remember the relationship between Lot and Abram or Abraham. Um, Lot is Abraham's nephew, um, and he followed Abraham when he left his 
his homeland, or of the Chaldeans. And he traveled with Abraham until God had so richly blessed them that their flocks were not able to, to stay together. The land couldn't support both of them, so they had to separate. And in great faith, Abraham allows Lot to choose where, which direction he wanted to go. Where in the promised land did he want to live? Because um, Abraham trusted that regardless of where he lived, the Lord would bless him. So he lets Abraham, he lets Lot choose um, which which uh, which part of the promised land he would he would go to and live in. And Lot chooses to live in the very rich, um, fertile plain of Zoar, where the chief cities are Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, and we're going to learn uh, in, in these verses that these are wicked cities and that they have a, uh, a terrible influence on Lot and on his family. Um, but just to remind ourselves of that relationship between Lot, Lot is, is Abraham's nephew, travels with Abraham, decides to go live. He chooses to go live in Sodom and Gomorrah. He gets captured by the coalition of the four kings. Um, gets rescued by Abraham and then goes back to living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in our lesson today, we're going to come across him again if, if we get to chapter 19. We'll see. Okay, well, with those couple of um, introductory comments, let's go ahead and jump right into the text. So we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Um, maybe just a little note about um, just the, uh, the text emphasizes the extravagance of the meal that Abraham um, provides. Uh, and it, and it, it does so by talking about... Um, getting three seahs of flour. Uh, a, three seahs, a sia weighs about 12 pounds. So three seahs of flour weighs about 36 pounds. So they're using 36 pounds of flour to make bread here. So this is not just a little loaf of bread that they're making. And this is a tremendous feast that is being prepared. The, the large amount of bread the choice calf and the curds and the milk. This is a, this is a, you know a, a venerable feast for these guests, these visitors. Now, um, in all likelihood, Genesis, uh, Hebrews chapter thirteen verse two, um, Hebrews thirteen verse two says, "Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it." It's very possible and maybe even likely that this verse from Hebrews 13 is an allusion to what we just read in uh, Genesis 18. Um, that um, Abram, Abram doesn't really or doesn't recognize or doesn't know yet that the guests that he is serving are is the Lord and two angels. We're going to find that out later um, in the story. We're going to find out that it was the Lord and he's accompanied by two angels. Um, but, uh, but at this point, Abraham doesn't know that. Um, so, and we kind of get that, we kind of find that out in Genesis and Hebrews 13. But he entertained angels without knowing it. According to these verses, 
Did Abraham know the identity of these visitors? It seems to be not. It seems that he didn't. Um, he doesn't use the covenant name of God when he says, my Lord, in verse 3. He says, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. You'll notice that the word Lord is not capitalized and it's not in small capital letters like it is in verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham. So Abraham is not using the covenant name of God here. He's not even using, um, he's, he's using the, um, the, the equivalent of what you or I would say, sir. It's just a polite way of addressing someone you don't know. Um, so something like, sir. Um, if I found favor in your eyes, sir, do not pass your servant by. Something that kind of raises the question that if Abraham doesn't recognize this as the Lord and two angels, then why is there so such extravagant, such an extravagant meal being prepared for them? And this is where I think it's important to know a little something about the culture of Abraham's day that's different than ours. Um, in Abraham's day, there was a culture of hospitality, um, a, a, a responsibility to help those who are traveling. And the reason is because there, you know, there weren't motels or hotels or inns um, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew world. Um, if you were a traveler and you were traveling any distance, any, any kind of distance that required a multi-day trip, then you were either going to be camping on the road, you're either going to be, you know, sleeping under bushes on the road, or you're going to be taken in by by someone in their home. And so there is this um, culture, a part of their culture is a culture of hospitality, where they are expected to go out of their way to, um, to show grace and to show um, uh, a welcome to give a, a warm and ex even extravagant welcome um, to travelers. So this is just a part of Abraham's culture um, that he is he is showing extravagant hospitality to these strangers, these travelers, because that is what would be would have that's what would have been expected of Abraham and his culture in that day. It doesn't necessarily mean that he recognizes that this is the Lord and two angels. He doesn't seem to recognize that until later. Um, but uh, for now, we can just say the reason why there's this extravagance in his, uh, in his preparations is because that's what was expected of someone in his position, someone of his wealth in an ancient world where, uh, where you were expected to show that kind of hospitality to strangers. And again, that, that goes to Hebrews 13. Um, you know, hospitality is supposed to be a mark of Christianity too. Not that we have to you know, go looking for strangers to welcome into our home. But um, we can be, uh, and we should be, we should show hospitality to those. I think maybe this says, says something to us about the way that we um, deal with, with, uh, visitors in our church services you know we're supposed to be we're supposed to show hospitality to them we're supposed to make them feel welcome we're not supposed to just hang out with people that we know in our little cliques and um, only only you know spend time with people that we are already friends with we're to go seek out and show hospitality to those who are new uh new to us or new to the the church or new to maybe even new to Christianity as a whole. Um, so and again, I, it maybe it doesn't have a perfect parallel to 21st century culture, American culture. I'm not saying go look for strangers to welcome into your home. But hospitality is a mark of, um, of the faithful. And, and we see that going on in Abraham in Abraham's story here in, in Genesis 18. Okay, now let's look at the, this is where things start to get interesting. Um, look at verses 9 to 15. And here's where the Lord is going to reveal himself to Abraham and to Sarah. So verse 9, where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. Now, this in and of itself shows that they know something that they shouldn't know. 
you know these strangers these are strangers to abraham they don't they don't they don't know abraham abraham doesn't know them and yet they know the name of his wife so there's already some kind of of what seems to be supernatural knowledge on display when they ask for his wife by name they don't just say where where is your wife but where is your wife sarah they seem to know her name, even her changed name, the name that was just changed in the previous chapter. They are in the tent, Abraham said. Then one of them said, one of the three men, who's not a man at all, but one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now again, maybe that in and of itself doesn't appear to be proof that this man who is speaking is the Lord. But remember that Abraham is 99 years old and Sarah is 89 years old. So for this stranger to come up to Abraham and say, I'm going to return in a year. And in that time, your 89 year old wife will have had a son. Um, that's, that's a miracle that only God could do. Um, so he's shown that he has knowledge that only God could have or only God could reveal at the least. And then um, uh, that he has the power that only God can have um, to give an 89-year-old woman a child. Um, so, uh, so that's maybe another hint that this is not just a man, that this is, that, that this is the Lord himself. Now, Sarah, this is the second half of verse 10. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? But the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. So um, so my first question is, um, how does Abraham learn that these are no ordinary visitors? Um, and we've already talked about some of these. They know that, he, that they're not any ordinary visitors because they know things that they shouldn't know, like Sarah's name, um, like the fact that Sarah is beyond the age of childbearing, that she, in a, in a year from now, is going to have had a son, um, and that uh, he, they, this, at least one of them, knows that, that Sarah laughs and knows her thoughts, knows um, this, uh, this, thought that she has, um, she, she laughs to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? She didn't necessarily say it out loud, she thought it, and yet the Lord knows, this man knows her thoughts. Um, um, and this uh, this terrifies Sarah so that she laughs, um, and we'll, um, well, we can talk about that right now. Um, or anyway, just uh, all of these things, the fact that he, this man knows things he shouldn't know and he does something that he shouldn't be able to do or does something that only God can do. The fact that he knows things that only God could know and does things that only God can do show, reveal to Abraham that this man, quote unquote man, is not really a man, but is the Lord having taken human flesh or the Lord having... Um, taken the form of a of a human being. And number three this is one of my favorite questions, my favorite little details in the in the Abraham story. Um, how is Sarah's reaction to the Lord's statement about her impending pregnancy similar to Abraham's reaction? If you remember from the last chapter, when Abraham hears that he and Sarah are going to have a child, he laughed. And at the time, we said that um, very likely. Uh, while it could be interpreted in two ways, very likely, uh, Abraham's laughter there is the laugh of faith. Um, it's, it's a delighted laugh. It's, it's the, the, the laugh of one who is, um, who is kind of bowled over by the goodness 
and the power of his God, um, that he is going to do this miraculous thing, that he's going to fulfill his promise, not, not just fulfill his promise, but fulfill his promise in a miraculous way, in the way of giving um, Sarah a, a child in her old age. Here, Sarah laughs, so that's similar, and this is yet another reason why their child is going to be named Isaac, which means he laughs. Um, because not only is Abraham the one who laughs, but so is Sarah. But how is this different? Well, Sarah's laugh is very clearly not a laugh of faith. Um, her laugh is very clearly kind of a scoff of, I don't want to say unbelief, but um, of, of maybe doubt, a scoff of doubt, um, a scoff of bitterness. Um, that that this is that she's had to wait this long. That only at only at this time is she, at this point in her life, is she going to enjoy the the status of becoming a mother? You know, she's had this failed attempt through Hagar, and the birth of Ishmael, and now after all these years, after all this waiting, um, and now that she's worn out, her body is worn out, and her womb closed. Now she's going to have a child. Um, so she kind of scoffs this laugh of, of doubt or this laugh of unbelief. You might say, well, how do you know that's the way that she was laughing? Um, if we give Abraham the benefit of the doubt that he was laughing out of faith, how come we don't give Sarah the benefit of the doubt that she was laughing out of faith? And the reason is because um, when God asks her, why did you laugh? She lies and says, I did not laugh. Well, if you were laughing out of faith, the laughter was coming out of faith, then she wouldn't have anything to lie about. She wouldn't have felt guilty about the laughter. And she wouldn't have lied to God about the laughter. Um, but because it was a scoff of unbelief, a scoff of doubt, um, we can be confident that it, that this um, this is why she lied about laughing um, and uh, so this this helps us see that while Abraham and Sarah both respond to the promise in the same way there's a similar there's a similarity in the way they respond to the promise with laughter there's also an important difference um, Abraham responds in faith while Sarah responds with doubt um, and it just sh that kind of serves as a contrast for for the two. Um, okay, so that takes us through verse 15. Now let's read verses 16 to 21. Um, and this is, uh, and I'll just preface this by saying, remember, now, now Abraham knows that the man that he's talking to is God. Now he knows that the man he's talking to is the Lord. Um, and so the, this, the, the tenor on the, of their conversation is going to change. Now, this, this isn't just um, one man showing another man hospitality. This is a believer who is interacting with his Lord and his God, who is interacting with the God who has appeared to him over time and made him amazing promises um, and is now bringing about the fulfillment of those promises in a very miraculous way. Um, so, um, the, the tenor of the conversation the, and, the, and the subject matter of the conversation is going to change. Um, having talked about the, the miraculous birth of Isaac, um, now they're going to turn their attention to the city of Sodom. All right, so with that in mind, we'll go ahead and read verses 16 to 21. When the men got up to leave... They looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked alongside them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, and this seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, this seems to be an internal dialogue. Um, this isn't necessarily something that God says out loud. This is something that God says to himself, or that um, it's like when God says, let us make man in our own image. That was something that was said um, within within himself or to himself, it's it's his, it's like talking to yourself kind of a thing. Um, so the Lord said, "Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? 
Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on the earth will be blessed through him. There's the messianic promise yet again. For I have um, chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham, for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, and this seems to be out loud, um, this seems to be something that Abraham would have heard. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Okay, so um, if we look at the, look at the, go back to our study guide, number four, um, God was under no obligation to share his plans for Sodom and Gomorrah with Abraham, and yet he chooses to do so. He, you know, he he didn't have to share with Abraham that he was going down to see um, whether the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah was as bad as has reached his ears. Um, he could have just left and done his thing. Um, but he chooses to let Abraham in on the plans, um, in on God's plan for Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is going to, is going to, be given knowledge of that. Um, he's going to be brought into the counsel of God uh, about his plan for Sodom and Gomorrah. And what does this teach about the way that God governs the universe? And I have um, a reference there, James 5, 16, which is a very famous passage from the book of James, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Um, God could run the world all by himself without any input from us. He, and he would be perfectly within his rights to do that. Um, and we might even think that that would be better if God did it that way. But that's not the way that God does it. God in his grace and in his mercy um, allows the prayers of his people to factor into the way that he governs the world. This is an important point for us to remember in our prayer lives, that prayer really does matter. Prayer really does change things. God really does take our prayers into account in the way that he rules and governs the world. That doesn't mean that he loses his sovereignty in any way. In other words, we can't make God do something against his will. Um, we can't buy our prayers um, override the sovereignty of God. But God in his sovereignty, without losing his sovereignty, um, without losing the fact that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he rules all things for the good of his people, um, he actually takes our prayers into account in the way that he governs and rules the world. He lets us in on the plan. He, he lets us be a part of the counsel of God. Um, and and he, but based on our prayers, the way that he governs the world changes. And, and uh, you know, elsewhere in the book of James, James is going to write the reason you have you do not have is because you do not ask. Um, that um, sometimes um, God is waiting for us to pray for a certain thing, or um, a a certain blessing is contingent on our prayer for it. Um, and so this is just a, a reminder to us. It's a powerful reminder, a beautiful reminder, a reminder of God's grace and mercy um, that our prayers really do make a difference. And that means not only that we pray, that we should pray, it's an encouragement to pray. It's an encouragement to pray boldly. Um, and it's an encouragement to pray big. Um, and maybe those two things are, are related, and they are related for sure. Maybe they're the same thing. But to pray boldly and to pray big. Um, last time we looked at, um, uh, maybe it was two times ago, we looked at um, the passage um, that God is able, from Ephesians, God is able to do immeasurably more than all, you ask, all we ask or imagine, according to the riches that are at work with us, um, according to the great power that is at work with us. So, um, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. We shouldn't ask little. We shouldn't. We shouldn't think little. Right? We shouldn't. We shouldn't um, be timid in our prayers, as if God is up there, not wanting to answer our prayers, or that our prayers are a bother to God. 
quite the opposite. God actually takes our prayers into account in the way that he governs the world. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And we're going to see how that works, how that takes place in this interaction between God and Abraham. Um, Abraham is actually going to persuade God to change the way that he approaches the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so just a, a beautiful reminder. This is a beautiful reminder, this fact that God lets Abraham in on his plan. is a beautiful reminder to us that we too have been made a part of the plan of God, the plan of salvation. We're, we're in on the plan of salvation. We know what God's plan of salvation is, to go and make disciples by baptizing and by teaching. Uh, and uh, and we are, we're a part of that mission. We're a part of the mission of God. And, uh, and our prayers make a difference. Um, so pray, pray, and pray boldly, pray big. Right, number five, in verse 21, God says, I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. And this is one of those times we've, we've seen this before. We've seen it in, Gen in Genesis 3 when God appears to, to Adam and Eve and asks, what is this you have done? We saw it in chapter 4 when he appeared to Cain and asked the same question, what is this you have done? Or where is your brother Abel? Is the way, and he asks it there, where is your brother Abel? We saw it in chapter 10 with the, with the Tower of Babel. Um, where God comes down to see the work that they were doing in building the Tower of Babel. And now we see it again here in chapter 18, where he comes down to see the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so I just want to emphasize this again. We've emphasized this every time we've come across this, but I want to emphasize it again. Why doesn't God come down? What isn't the reason that God goes and sees? And the re it, it isn't because he actually needs to go and see. It isn't that he doesn't know what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. The reason I bring this up is because there's there's some people, negative critics, those who, who don't accept God's word, don't accept the Bible as God's word, that don't believe in an error and see. Who don't believe that God's word has no errors or mistakes in it. Who who view the Bible as being kind of the evolution of, revel, of, of religious thought. Um, and one of those, sometimes those uh, advocates of a negative critical view of the scriptures argue that this is evidence of a time before people thought that God was omniscient, that God knew everything. And so God has to come down and look for himself to see if things are as bad as, as um, they've been made out to be. That God isn't omniscient, so he has to come see for himself. He has to come see with his own eyes. That's why I want to be careful just to, to be very obvious or very clear or very upfront about the fact that the reason that God comes to see is not because he needs to come and see. It's not that he doesn't already know. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows exactly what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't need to come down to see it with his own eyes, so to speak, um, because he is omniscient. He knows everything. Why does he do so? Well, why did God, um, why did God come down to see the Tower of Abel? Why does God confront Cain and uh, Cain and Adam and Eve with their sin? Um, God is a God of perfect justice. Um, God doesn't act on uh, unless the evidence is overwhelmingly true or overwhelmingly the case and I don't like the way I'm saying this he doesn't act um, unjustly and so he, or arbitrarily maybe that's the word I'm looking for he doesn't act arbitrarily um, when when he brings judgment and punishment upon someone, it's for a reason. It's 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 right. It's it's the it's the just thing to do. He doesn't he doesn't bring judgment unjustly, and so he comes down to see so that he so that every um, every shred of evidence can be 
um, then nobody can say that God didn't take the evidence into account. I mean, it comes down to see so that it's clear to everyone that he has made a fair decision, that his decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and hopefully I'm not spoiling the story for you when I say that Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed, um, but when Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed, um, that is that is God's justice at work, and his justice is based on fact. His justice is based on reality. Um, and, and so he comes down so that, um, so that his justice cannot be questioned, so that the fairness of his judgment cannot be in, um, under, under question in any way. So that's the reason why it comes. Not because he needs to find out for himself. He already knows. Um, but he comes down so that there can be no question about the fairness of, of his justice, the fairness of his judgment. Okay, and with that in mind, now we'll finish the chapter verses 22 to 33. So this is a longer section, um, 22 to 33, and this is the very famous part of this part of the of the story, where Abraham intercedes on behalf of the the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. So beginning with verse 22. Then the men turned away and went toward Sodom. So the men seem to be the other two that we're going to find out later in the story are angels. So the other two turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find forty-five there, the Lord said, I will not destroy it. Once again, Abraham spoke to the Lord. What if only forty are found there? The Lord said, for the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me... But let me speak, what if only 30 can be found there? The Lord answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? The Lord said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just one more, once more. What if only 10 can be found there? The Lord answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. All right, so looking at um, the top of page 2 on our study guide, um, Genesis 18, 22 to 33, what are some of the remarkable characteristics of Abraham's prayer? Well, I think maybe the, the thing that stands out first and foremost is the boldness of Abraham in his prayer. Um, that he is not in any way timid, especially at the beginning. Um, you know, um, in fact, his words at the beginning, uh, beginning with like verse uh, 23, 23 to 25, where he kind of borderline accuses God or, is a, or says that if God were to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, he would be sinning. He would be sweeping away the righteous with the wicked. Far be it from the Lord to do such a thing as to sweep away the righteous from the wicked uh, and the wicked, to treat the righteous and the wicked the same way, to bring the same judgment upon the righteous as he does upon the wicked. Far be it from him. So that, that that's it's almost confrontational, the way that Abraham comes across to, to God there. But I think what's really going on there is, is Abraham being bold. Um, And the reason that I say that, really this is another remarkable point um, about Abraham's prayer, is that his prayer is based on the character of God. 
He doesn't say, God, will you do me a favor and, and spare the city of Sodom for the sake of 50 people? Um, what Abraham does is he says, God, I know what kind of God you are. You are a God that is just and does not treat the righteous and the wicked in the same way. You are a God who does not bring judgment upon the righteous the same way you bring judgment upon the wicked. And so, God, I'm appealing to you. I'm asking for this. I'm asking, making this request that you not destroy, that you would spare the city if you can find 50 righteous people. Um, I'm making this request on the basis of who you are, on the basis of your character. Um, based on who you are as, as a God who is perfectly just and does not treat the righteous and the wicked in the same way, I'm appealing to you on the basis of who you are, um, why you should spare the city um, for the sake of 50 righteous people. So um, Abraham isn't asking for his sake, but for the Lord's sake, or he's not asking for on the basis of his own character, but on the basis of the Lord's character. And again, I think this has application to our prayer lives. Um, you know, I think uh, many times, many of the things that we ask are, are things that um, God has neither promised nor forbidden. Um, and whenever we pray for those things that God has not specifically promised, we always add the caveat, not my will, but yours be done. You know, if you are willing um, if it is a part of your will, then may this happen. We recognize that we don't, we can't make God do anything. And, and so, and because so much of what we pray for lies outside of the revealed will of God, a lot of, we, we, we very often qualify our prayers with not my will, but yours be done. But when we pray for something that God has promised, let's just say, for example, the forgiveness of sins. That's something that God has promised, that in Christ Jesus, all of our sins are forgiven. We do not have to come to God and say, Lord, if you are willing, please forgive my sins. God has already promised that he is willing. And so we can say, we can come to God and say, on the basis of your promise, on the basis of who you are, I know that you are a God who always keeps his promises. And you have promised that my sins are forgiven in Christ. Therefore, I ask that you would forgive me, forgive me all my sins. That's not something you have to add the caveat of, of your will be done, or only if you are willing. God's already shown that he is willing. He's already promised that to us. Um, and so, um, when we too, like Abraham, we can pray according to the character of God. Um, we can bait when, when we base our prayers on the things that he has promised us, um, then uh, then that um, makes it uh, makes it it's really what really what's going on is we are making our faith clear to God. We're clinging to him in faith, kind of like Jacob is going to do when he when he won't let God go when he's wrestling with God and he won't let God go. Um, that's what we're doing. We're clinging to God in faith, not. Um, not letting him, so to speak, go back on his promises. Not that he's not, not that he would anyway, but uh, we're, we're claiming the things that God has promised on the basis of God's character because he's the God who fulfills all of his promises in Christ. Um, so you've got one of, the, one of the remarkable things about Abraham's prayer is the boldness with which he approaches God. But also say you see that boldness in the way that he comes to God again and again and again and again, right? So he doesn't just ask once, but he asks twice and then a third time and then a fourth time and then a fifth time. So um, the boldness of God is on the, uh, the boldness of Abraham is on display, and the and not just in what he says, but in the number of times that he says it and the way that he comes to God over and over and over again. And then, um, lastly, the, the, I think the third kind of characteristic of Abraham's prayer that I think is remarkable, that is worth, you know, worth considering and, and emulating in our own prayer lives, is that, is that tied into this boldness is also this great humility. 
Um, and you see this when Abraham says, you know, things like in verse 20, 27, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. Um, so it, um, Abraham is confessing that he doesn't deserve to have God hear and answer his prayers. Um, that, you know, it's not that he is not that he's earned it or that he's deserved it. Um, he recognizes that he's nothing but dust and ashes. He, it's a it's a great humility with which he approaches God. And verse 30, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. Um, but there's this um, or, um, you know, and then there's the repetition. Verse 31, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord. Or verse 22, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. So you got this great humility. So I think that what's what's always struck me as being especially beautiful about Abraham's prayers or Abraham's intercession on behalf of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is how he combines boldness with humility. And I think that that is the kind of attitude that we should emulate in our own prayers too that we want to combine these ideas of um, great boldness, trusting that God is who he has revealed himself to be, um, and, and basing our prayers on who he has revealed himself to be, um, on his character, um, ca um, claiming the promises of God um, with the confidence of faith that if he's promised, he will, he will surely give it. But then do those things with great humility, recognizing that we are unworthy um, beggars, that, that anything that we have from God is a gift from him, is a sign of his mercy and grace. Um, and Abraham just does such a remarkable job in this section of scripture of combining those two things, of combining boldness and humility. That's what's always struck me about this section of scripture. Okay, so we're out of time for today. Um, we are not going to meet next week. So next Tuesday, the 15th, we will not have our class. The reason is because um, um, all the pastors of the Southeastern Wisconsin District, we have our um, annual pastors conference. Or can, um, it's a conference this year. Um, in fact, it's the, all the pastors, male teachers, and staff ministers um, and the district will be meeting um, this year virtually. Usually we meet in person, but this year we're meeting virtually um, to discuss the issues that the Senate Convention will be taking up later this summer. Um, and so it, it gives pastors the opportunity to consider the, um, the issues that the Senate Convention will be talking about and um, even to provide input to the Senate um, about, about those issues. So next week during this time, I will be at our um, district conference virtually. So we won't meet next week um, on the 15th. When we come back again on the 22nd, um, then we'll pick up where we left off here in Genesis chapter 19, when we'll get the actual story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But with that being said, so remember, no class next week. We'll see you in two weeks. With that being said, let's close with a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much, and God's blessings to you in Christ Jesus.